there. If you're new here, thanks for stopping by. Every Friday, we sit down and chat about a case that we feel has an important message that can help others in similar situations, save a life, change mindsets, or even contribute in changing laws. But before we dive in, here's a little side note. Every bit of information, images, or footage was compiled from what's available online, or if we were lucky in some cases, from the very people closest to the case. All opinions expressed are our own. We mean absolutely no disrespect. So don't click out and stay a while. Today, we're going to dive in to the incredible story of Mary and Beth Stoffer. Our first season, Stalking a Crime, was carefully selected because of the impact this particular crime has had on some members of our own family. Although we are covering other cases on this topic that have touched us, this season is dedicated to the Alice Ruggles trial. We are also using our podcast as a platform to contribute in some way to getting information out to you on recognizing the signs of stalking, reporting the crime, what you can do to make a clean break from a stalker, and where you can find the help you might be desperate for. It may take one little piece of information to get someone the help they need. The Alice Ruggles Trust is taking steps to get laws changed and provide the right tools to combat this awful crime that most often goes unrecognized until serious harm occurs. I, unfortunately, never got the pleasure. Together, let's lock arms and operate under the assumption that prevention is better than cure. And without further ado, let's dive into today's episode. Imagine living in a world where someone was following you around, watching you from afar, and repeatedly calling you without consent. Now imagine going about your business without ever knowing or sensing you are being watched or close to imminent danger. This is exactly the case of Mary Stoffer. We're going to travel back in time, back to a time before I was even born. Mary moved to Hermantown with her family when she was only 10. And after graduating from Hermantown High School, Mary went on to attend Bethel College in St. Paul until 1965, where she graduated. She met and married a Bethel College seminary student named Irv Stauffer. Mary taught ninth grade math for two years at Ramsey High School. The couple then flew to the Philippines as missionaries for the first time in the 1967-1968 school year. During her time teaching at Ramsey High, she seemed to be very well liked by most of her students. After the couple returned from their missionary trip in the Philippines, Mary Stoffer took a teaching job in North Minneapolis for a couple of years. Thereafter, the couple then moved to Polk, Nebraska, where her husband, Irv, who'd become a Baptist minister by then, was the pastor to a congregation. They initially planned to stay in Nebraska only for a couple of years, but ended up staying for five years, and this is also where both of their children were born. By 1975, they went back to the Philippines for four years, starting new churches and spreading the good word on the Central Islands. Throughout this whole time, Mary remained unaware that she was the object of a seething, growing obsession in one of her former Ramsey High students. Unable to keep his obsession from poking its ugly head and unsatisfied with lurking in the shadows, the student showed up at Mary's in-law's house in Duluth, confusing Mary's husband with his father since they were both called Irv. The man in question held Irv Sr. at gunpoint. He ordered him in the house and told him to call his wife to the room. But when Mary's mother-in-law walked into the room, the assailant realized his confusion. He tied them both up and threatened them, saying that if they ever called the police, he would come back and finish the job. 
He then proceeded to lock them in a bedroom downstairs. His threats were frightening enough that they obeyed his orders and never reported the incident to the police. They didn't even mention it to their son or daughter-in-law once they've returned from the Philippines in 1979. When the former student found out the couple had returned from the Philippines and moved to the Baptist Missionary Apartments in Arden Hills, Minnesota, he increased his stalking of Mary even more. Spying on them from the woods outside the apartments, he attempted to break in through the patio doors using a blowtorch, and also through the storage area, cutting holes in the floor underneath their bed, which left sawdust, something that Irv swept up without a second thought. The young man also knew where the couple kept the spare key to the apartment. He saw packing crates in the home and knew the Storfers were about to leave soon on another four-year mission trip abroad. This led to the young man ramping up his stalking activities and mentally preparing himself to act soon. It was a Friday, May 16, 1980, 42 years ago today, that Mary Stoffer started what looked like a really busy day, sorting out all the last-minute preparations before their imminent departure. She first took her six-year-old son, Steve, to get a haircut in the morning, and in the late afternoon, returned to the salon with her daughter, Beth. Mary was unlocking the passenger side door of her 1973 Ford, which was provided by the church, when a man a young man, approached them. 36-year-old Mary initially thought that the man wanted directions. He had a gun in his waistband, and he calmly placed it at Beth's side and said, I need a ride. Mary thought he just wanted to steal the car, and she was ready to hand over the car keys, but the assailant had other plans for them. He forced them into the car and instructed Mary to drive north. During the car ride, Mary, a devout woman of faith, tried to appeal to his good side, stating that God would help him in his time of troubles. But all he responded was, shut up and drive. A police car even pulled right behind them at an intersection. But the man threatened to shoot Beth if the police were somehow alerted or followed them. To her great relief, if you can call it that, both cars headed in opposite directions. They were made to drive in a remote wooded area where both mother and daughter were bound together with their mouths covered with medical tape before being forced face down in the boot of the car. 39 years later, Beth recalls over her phone interview she was so scared. There was nothing in her world that made any sense. They didn't know who he was or what he wanted. The man then drove back to Roseville and proceeded to a nearby parking lot to retrieve his van. He opened the trunk and put the vehicle's massive spare tire on top of Mary and Beth, as they later recalled. Once he was doing that, two young neighbourhood boys noticed something strange. One of them stayed out front, whilst the other, Jason Wilkman, went around the back to investigate, throwing Mary and Beth's abductor into a panic, so he grabbed Jason and threw him on top of Mary and Beth in the boot. The boy was understandably shaken and sobbed uncontrollably. Mary tried communicating with the young boy, but he was too frightened. He couldn't say anything else other than his name and his age. He wouldn't stop crying, recalls Mary, and said he needed to get home because he needed to go visit his grandmother that weekend. And Beth recalled that she mentioned to him that she was also supposed to visit hers as well. Upon returning to the wooded area in Anoka County, the abductor grabbed Jason and a crowbar, and they both disappeared for a very long time. He didn't open the trunk when he returned. Instead, he just started the car and took off. Jason wasn't to rejoin them. He tied them up in his black windowless van in an effort to ditch Mary's car once and for all. He proceeded to take them to an electronic store he owned, where he allowed them to use the bathroom and gave them juice before blindfolding them and stuffing them back into his van 
taking them on a final journey to his family home in Roseville, which happens to be located a mere six miles from Mary's own home. He placed them shackled and chained together in the closet of a back bedroom, measuring only four foot long and 21 inches wide. He removed the doorknob from inside and locked the door. Looking around as much as she could, Mary realized that the closet space had been pre-prepared for them with blankets, a couple of small fro pillows, a small rug, and a light bulb with a pull chain. There was no item of clothing hanging in there. Six miles away, Irv and Steve were home waiting. Mary's sister Sandra came over for a pre-planned dinner, but there was still no word of Mary or Beth. Irv called the salon, and the hairstylist confirmed that both mother and daughter had left around 4.30pm. That evening he couldn't sleep. He was concerned, worrying about his daughter and his wife. He told his fellow colleagues who lived in the, in the same apartment complex about their disappearance, and they spent the night calling local hospitals to see if they had been admitted. Irv called the police later that night. However, at the time, the police were more concerned about the disappearance of Jason Workmans. His friend, who had stayed up front and witnessed his abduction, had run home to his family and reported the abduction of Jason. And since he was not able to see what was in the trunk of the car, he had no clue about the first kidnapping. Police initially thought that the disappearance of Mary was due to a domestic problem, hence not a priority. It wasn't until the following morning that the link was made between both cases and it became clear that the cases were related as investigators searched the park area where Jason was taken and the license plate from the Stoffer's car was found, torn off by the heavy brush. Finally, there was a connection and as many as 300 officers and volunteers began the search for Mary and Beth Stoffer as well as Jason Wilkman who was six years old at the time of his abduction. Six miles away from her home, day two of her and Beth's abduction began. That day would reveal which of the two was the real target of the abduction and the identity of the abductor when Mary was brought out of the closet, tied to a piece of furniture on a blanket laid out in the living room, where a three-hour videotaped interview began. It isn't until he asked, do you remember a student who developed a formula for an algebra problem, that Mary remembered him and recalls that that particular student had never caused her any troubles in class. Ming Sen Xiu told Mary that the B grade Mary gave him as a freshman was a stain on his otherwise spotless record, and because of that he was unable to receive an academic scholarship, that since his father had died he couldn't afford college without a scholarship, therefore was instead drafted into the Vietnam War, where he became a prisoner of war, that all his failures were her fault. But these were all lies. Xu finished number one in his high school class. He was voted most likely to succeed by his peers. He reportedly attended the University of Minnesota and never served a day in the US military. It was a ruse to get Mary to feel some sort of remorse or regret for giving him a B in class. Xu began to remove her bottoms, pulling her shirt above her head all the while saying that he didn't want her scars to be physical, but emotional. How he wanted her to feel dirty and degraded. He videotaped at least six hours of the rape of Mary. He raped her daily thereafter. Mary worried he might do similar to her daughter Beth, but Shu flatly told her that he was no child molester, and he never did touch Beth in that way. Shu repeatedly played mind games with Mary and Beth for the 53 days that he held them captive. (music) 
It was later revealed that Xu had written fantasy short stories of actresses and other women he would rape, and who in turn would then beg for his sexual favours. Among the women on Xu's fantasy list was none other than his compassionate ninth grade math teacher, Mary Stoffer. And since Mary wasn't showing him the affection that she had in his twisted fantasies, he upped the ante, insisting Mary be more loving towards him. When Mary told him she couldn't, that she loved her husband and she promised to be true to him until death, he got a big clear plastic bag and said, Have you ever watched someone die by suffocation? You're going to watch your daughter die by suffocation. He put this clear plastic bag over Beth's whole body as she sat in the closet. He tucked it underneath her and said, It'll take four to five minutes. She'll gradually breathe up all the oxygen in the bag and then she'll die. Beth said to Mary, Mom, what does he want you to do? Mary responded, He wants me to sin. She told her mum, Don't sin, but please, can I come out from under this bag? Because it's so hot in here. Mary could see the perspiration running down her face and the bag was contracting around her face. It was horrible. She didn't have any words to describe it. Not wanting to watch her whole family die, because Shu had also told her he would kill her husband and son if she didn't comply. Mary gave her abductor a peck on the cheek, but that's not good enough for Shu. He said that's not enough. So she gave him a peck on the lips, and that was enough to get him to take the bag off Beth. And what followed was the most horrible sessions of rape, but at least she knew Beth was safe. On another occasion, to show his control, Shu went to work with Beth in a box in his van and left her there for four hours on a hot summer day, and amazingly, it did not kill her. Soon, Shu started to relax his rules, slowly, allowing them to eat upstairs with him and allowing them to finally shower on the tenth day of their abduction. Shu provided Beth with a TV and board games, He weirdly became affectionate like a parent to Beth, even calling her Bethy. He also forced Mary to write two letters to Irv, her husband, to try and convince the police to leave it alone, that she wasn't missing at all, that she left of her own choosing. He made them go on a road trip to Chicago in a motorhome. He tried to make them act like a family. It was just weird. It wasn't until Monday morning of July 7th that Mary and Beth finally managed to free themselves from the court they were tied to and were able to call the Ramsey County Sheriff's Office whilst she was at work. Mary had managed to find a dry cleaning tag in the closet with the address which she transmitted so police could find them. When Mary managed to call the Ramsey County Sheriff's Office, she was put on hold twice before Sergeant Mike Fowler came on the line. She said, This is Mary Stoffer the Arden Hills kidnap victim, and I would like someone to come get us. She later recalls, in an interview with TwinCities.com, I'll never forget his words. He said, Is Jason with you? That's when I knew that Jason had never made it home and was most likely dead. That was worse than the rapes or the initial kidnapping. Just like Jason, I had a six-year-old son. Friendly just like Jason. I could picture it happening to him and I thought about Jason's parents and prayed. It was devastating for me. Within minutes, that seemed like an eternity, the police arrived and they were whisked away to their freedom. also admits his faith in spirituality was tested during that time. He said, During the seven and a half weeks, there were so many fears and concerns. We didn't know if we would ever see them again. That was the most difficult part. Faith is all he had to hang on to. At one point during the ordeal, FBI agent Gary Samuel called Irv and told him 
that an unidentified woman's body had been found in southern Minnesota and was being transported to the Twin Cities. It was a relief and an encouragement when they found out that the woman's body was not Mary's. During the few times that Shu took Mary and Beth out, out and about, pretending to be a family going about their business, Mary tried to find ways to alert the authorities. She couldn't do it openly because he kept Beth close to him to prevent Mary from telling anyone. She used a traveler's check from her purse while shopping, hoping the bank would be notified of the transaction. Even though Irv had alerted the FBI to the existence of the check, the FBI apparently was not notified when the check cleared. Left alone in the motorhome, Beth tried yelling to a group of teenage boys outside the window. It was a moment of pure bravery, she recalls, as she called out and said, Hey, can you get me some help? I've been kidnapped. They basically laughed at her and told her to stop making up stories and went about their way. Jason Wilkman never made it home. He was murdered by Shu. Mary and Beth Stoffer managed to escape their abductor and made it home to their family, however not unscathed by their ordeal. The FBI arrested Shu at his workplace without further incidents. But days after his imprisonment, Shu tried to hire his cellmate who was about to be released to kill Mary and Beth with $1,000 up front and a promise of 50000 after the deed was done. Thankfully, the FBI had been tracking his finances and were able to follow the payments made to Richard Green, the cellmate in question. A deal was made with Shu, so police could locate and retrieve Jason's body. Shu was sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole for 30 years in the case of Mary and Beth Stoffer. But this is not the end of the saga of Ming Shu. When Mary testified during the federal trial, Shu lunged at her, but he was intercepted by the prosecutor. And during the trial for killing Jason, Shu attacked Mary using a knife he had smuggled into the courtroom. And whilst Mary was being whisked away to safety, she got cut. Mary received 62 stitches. Shu was found guilty of second-degree murder in the case of Jason Wilkman's murder. He received 40 years to be served concurrently with the first sentence of 30 years. He was denied parole in 2010, and as of November 2019, Shu was housed in a medium-security federal prison in Marion County. All right, before we check out, I'd just like to remind you to join us next week on our roundtable discussion for this case, The Final Scoop. In the meantime, stay safe.